Good morning and welcome to today's online workshop. Uh, the focus today will be the use of aeration during fermentation. My name's Matt Holdstock. I'm one of the senior knowledgeists here at the Adabarai and I'll be facilitating today's workshop. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Adabarai acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and expend that, extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So today's workshop is going to focus on the practical aspects of aerating ferments, looking at both the equipment and the technology available um, and the different ways that this can be implemented. So we've brought together uh, various people, uh, presenters today with various experience in this area to cover off on these aspects. And just having a quick look, we've got something in the vicinity of 380 people registered for today's workshop. So I think this shows the amount of interest in this topic. I'd also like to acknowledge our funding body, Wine Australia, who generously provide the funds to enable us to run events like these through our extension program. So today's program we've got a short but exciting program and a, a short exciting list of speakers for you today there's four presenters and there'll be four presentations the last presenter Antonio Denisi unfortunately is unable to be with us this morning so his re, his um, presentation has been recorded and we'll play that at the end of uh, at the end of the session this session is being recorded today so if you miss something or want to review something you're more than welcome to visit the Adabri YouTube channel and this workshop will be uh, put on there within 24 hours of today's presentation. The aim of the workshop uh, for attendees today is to be able to walk away with the knowledge required to implement aeration of red ferments, understand the equipment that you need and also to find out where there'll be more information should you require it at a later stage for support on this topic. I expect many questions and we're going to have time at the end. I've allowed 20 to 25 minutes at the end to cover off on these. So if you'd like to provide a comment or a question throughout the presentations, um, the way to do this is simply by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, screen on the, on, the Zoom, on the Zoom software. Type in your question and click send it through. We'll be monitoring these throughout the, uh, throughout the workshop and we'll, um, we'll uh, facilitate these at the end of the session. But feel free to send through questions at any stage. So let's make a start this morning. Uh, our first presenter is Luke Wilson. Uh, Luke is the General Services and Engineering Manager at Yolumba Family Winemakers in the Barossa Valley. He's also Deputy President and a Director of the Winery Engineering Association. Luke is a chemical engineer and holds a graduate diploma in enology and he has 17 years experience in the wine industry. Luke comes with a wealth of practical experience in this space of aeration and he's gonna share some of his knowledge with us today. So over to you, Luke, I'll just get you to share your screen and jump off mute. Unmute that and we'll, uh, we'll see how we go. All right, so I'll just uh, share this. How are we going? Is that coming through okay? Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so we've been uh, playing in the aeration of red ferment space for, for we, you know, focusing on probably since 2014. So it's been sort of seven. Um, eight years of of, um, of experience in this space. And it's something that we're still quite excited about, still learning um, all the time, um, but something that we're, we're rolling out uh, regularly across the, across the winemaking, um, across both our Barossa Valley sites in particular. Um, so I guess the first question is why we're adding oxygen. Um, we're, a lot of our uh, a lot of our experiences come from some of the research done by Simon Schmidt and Martin Day at AWRI, as well as conversations with uh, with Roger, who I'm delighted to see has joined us today as well. Um, so for us, some of the some of the key learnings that we've picked up from this is we know oxygen is good for yeast health, um, but how much is too much? Is can you get too much of a good thing? Um, is there an advantage? Um, obviously. With with oxygen, like all things, there's a there's a cost to in in effort and and resource that, that can go into adding things to the wine. So what's the what's the right amount? Um, so one of the things we discovered early on was that overdosing using air 
in wine was actually really hard to do. So, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't really a case of too much of a good thing. Um, it certainly increased uh, the, the fermentation performance. Um, this was shown by some trials done using nitrogen um, because there were some initial um, questions over whether it was, you know, the, the presence of CO2 putting stress on the, on the yeast cells as well. Um, whereas this could be seen by removing that CO2 and effectively, effectively removing, removing that using nitrogen, um, which didn't have a, 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 an improvement actually made the, made the ferment worse and um, I think led to a stuck ferment in, in one uh, situation. Um, but we want to we wanted do it not just from a, a fermentation kinetics point of view, but also we're trying to achieve some positive sensory, sensory attributes. So um, smoother tannins, um, which you know are, are akin to to wines that are aging over time. So obviously, if, particularly with a commercial wine, um, where we can achieve a, a wine that's ready for market a little bit earlier, um, that that's obviously got a benefit, um, as as well as you know, um, trying to achieve the the best representation of the fruit that we've got in the vineyard as well. Um, so some of the other advantages uh, that we found was obviously we've got that reduced. Uh, uh, formation of sulfides in the wine um, and whether that's you know during fermentation or later in the wine's life um, you know that's one thing that we see where you've got a, a, a stressed fermentation is sometimes those wines you know you might be able to overcome them with a bit of uh, DAP or you know in some instances people will add, uh, will add copper to, to treat that um, but then they come back later in life as well. Um, we've also used this as, a, as an opportunity to minimize SO2 use on grapes in the vineyard um, that then was also linked through to, to that formation of sulfides um, in the wines during fermentation later in their life. Um, and by having a happier, healthier fermentation, well, then we're not adding that uh, DAP and, uh, and copper during the fermentation. Um, and, and all of this lines up with, with our you know, overall um, winemaking philosophy of minimal intervention, um, you know, using, using oxygen, which is you know, naturally abundant, to help the yeast through the through the fermentation and um, minimise the risk of stuck ferments while you know achieving the best outcome for the wine um, later on. Uh, so some of the some of the aeration rates that that we used um, the initial trials that that were done with AWI were looking at between two and a half and five grams of oxygen per litre, having a positive impact. Um, now we were looking at this for uh, you know, an industrial scale, you'd say, or, you know, large, certainly large format. Um, so we're looking at, you know, 30 ton, 100 ton fermenters. So when you're looking at the amount of air that was going to be required in these instances, um, that was significant and, you know, it was, it was going to require significant investment. Um, so one of the reasons uh, we looked at lower rates was, you know, we weren't just doing this on, on lab one, we were doing this on wine that was, was in production, was, you know, going to be saleable. Um, so we, we end up settling on about 1.6, and that's been really useful for us. Um, we have found that, you know, this is sort of that happy medium point where um, we can we can get that positive impact, but also, you know, as I mentioned before, there's a minimal cost um, associated with that as well. Um, and then going forward, looking at, you know, what's the what's the labour uh, and equipment cost to, to deliver these. Um, for us, there's always been a small amount of oxygen introduced for yeast health and preventing stuck ferments using pump overs and drain returns and uh, things like that. But I'll, I'll talk about that um, in one of the next slides. So for me, one of the one of the key things is where where are you going to get your oxygen from? Um, so the way I said, this, there's three key you know sources you can get. So you can get bottled oxygen. Um, we do use that occasionally in uh, in some fermenters where you need you know a reasonable amount, or we also use it in in hyperox where you might be wanting to achieve a, a chemical reaction where you want a, a higher rate of oxygen going into the system. Um, you've got atmospheric air, which is you know air from from the uh, the surrounding environment, or compressed air, which is you know uh, being forced into the vessel. So for atmospheric air, um, well, the best thing about it is free and readily available. Um, one thing I would say 
that you should consider is whether there's any contaminants in the nearby environment. So wherever you're setting up your system, you know, whether it's near the fermenters, if there's a lot of dust or dirt or anything like that, if you're drawing in air and adding it to the wine, well, that's obviously going to be going to the wine as well. Um, so that's something to, to consider. But obviously any system that can use atmospheric air that drives into the system is you know, going to be a lower cost typically than, than trying to supply um, a compressed form of gas. Um, so one way we can, we can readily uh, add atmospheric air into a system is by, by using a Venturi. Uh, so this is a, a Mazo injector that we, uh, we had set up. It's got a non-return on it. Um, so the non-return's there to um, prevent the wine coming back out of it when, uh, when the pump stops and the, the line is, is full of liquid. Um, this was set up on, a, um, on an existing Tui Farm Potter fermenter with, a, with an overhead irrigator. Um, and Venturi's are very effective, but they need to be set up with the right pump dynamic. So um, in this instance, we already had the pump over system set up. We already had the, um, it set for a, a specific flow rate over a certain amount of time. And you know, these, uh, these devices work by uh, increasing the velocity of the, the liquid through a, a, a small um, through a small hole to, to draw air into that using the, the pressure differential. Um, these can be really effective, don't require a lot of management, but the problem we had was that with these pumps, they were set up for a specific flow over a specific time. They had um, quite an open impeller, and that then meant that the pressure drop on those pumps effectively meant that we had to pump them over four times as long to get the same volume through them. So um, in this instance, trying to retrofit them to an existing system was very challenging. Uh, now, if you've got a portable uh, pump where you're using it for multiple vessels, uh, then perhaps swapping out a single pump to do multiple vessels may be, a, may be a, a really good solution for you. In this instance, for us to use it on, on these vessels, we would have been using um, an additional pump to try and drive the, drive the air into the system. Um, another option, which I mentioned before, is just using a sieve. So by being able to drain and return, or um, sometimes at a drain and chill stage as well, using that as an option to try and um, aerate the, the ferment a little bit on the way in and way out can be a really um, easy method of adding a bit of oxygen. It's also something that you know we've, we've traditionally done a couple of times during a during standard fermentation. As I mentioned, it's easy. The problem with it though, is it's labor intensive. Uh, so where you're drawing the, the wine out and putting it back in, that's, a, that's effectively an operation. So you, know, you might be limited to only doing it a couple of times during fermentation, um, which you know, can limit your, your impact. Um, now this can be going through um, a, a skin sieve, which I've got you know, a picture of there. Or we keep going through a rotary screen, which is quite good because that uh, that enables you know quite a thin film um, to enable better better oxygen trans uh, transfer, or a, or a trommel screen as well. So um, depending on what you've got access to, this can be quite a quite a useful um, useful option to to get some air into the into the wine um, quickly and easily without having to invest in in new equipment or systems. So as I mentioned before, bottled oxygen is is uh, is, a, is an option for supplying uh, oxygen into your ferment as well. Um, high purity, you know, you you get you get high high grade oxygen quite readily from your gas supplies. The challenge with it though is the cost of oxygen. Um, so you know when I'm talking about the the additional labour involved in some of the other the processes, then you know where you're adding uh, bottled oxygen, this uh, the cost per you know, per liter or per, per gram of oxygen is quite a bit higher than the other, the other systems. Um, I always get a little bit nervous playing with bottled oxygen, um, particularly around like rotary fermenters or anything like that, where you've got uh, grease, um, which can then, you know, catch fire if there's, a, if there's a leak or things like that. So I, I do get a little bit nervous using oxygen where I don't have to. Um, one of the advantage like with other compressed gases is that it's a lot easier to control the dosage going into the, into the vessel. Um, so you know, by being able to measure uh, the oxygen going in, uh, then you can understand exactly what impact you should be having on the wine. 
Um, but to me, I think for these applications, it's unnecessary to be to playing with um, bottled oxygen, um, particularly when you know, we're looking at the size of our fermenters and the number of ox uh, oxygen bottles that are, that are required to achieve the results we're looking for. Uh, compressed air is is another solution. So we, we're trying to drag it in through uh, an atmospheric means as possible. Um, compressed air might be a, might be another solution for you. So this is a um, it's more expensive, obviously, than atmospheric air because there's the energy involved in in compressing it and storing and trans transporting it, um, as well as you know the maintenance and ongoing costs of a um, air compressor system. Most wineries would typically have an air compressor on site for, for bag presses and things like that anyway. Um, if you're buying it in cylinders that, that is food grade air, then that can be you know, quite an expensive uh, way to do it as well. Um, particularly when you consider, you know, you've only got 20% of the, the volume you're using is the oxygen that you're chasing. Um, an air compressor, air compressor air may require um, additional treatment as well. So depending on the style of air compressor you've got, uh, depending whether it's a food grade air compressor, um, it may require additional filtration or treatment. Um, but as I mentioned with the oxygen, having a, having a compressed gas enables you to deliver it with greater control as well than you know, some of the other atmospheric systems. So you can, you can uh, turn it up and turn it down uh, as you need. Um, and also from that, it can be more easily traced and measured. So by being able to, to trace and measure it, then hopefully you can you can refine uh, your additions and uh, and fine tune it if you want. So as far as what filtration is required, a lot of this depends on what air compressor you've got. Um, so food grade air um, typically will require some form of food grade filtration. Um, so I've, I've sort of given some examples of what you might need if you're using a standard air compressor. Um, you need an air dryer. Now you probably find most um, air compressors will, will have an air dryer attached to them anyway. Um, you also need a, some form of coalescer and some filtration, um, typically like 0.003 micron. I think that's equivalent of a 0.2 micron in a, in a liquid uh, filter housing. Um, so, you know, what I'd suggest if you're looking at this option, have a chat with your friendly gas filtration specialist. They can advise um, what's the best option in your, in your circumstances. Um, also consider a dust filter if drawing in from outside air. So as I mentioned, you know, with with that atmospheric air, if you're a if your winery's got a lot of um, dirt nearby or you, you might have dust blowing in, um, then you may want to be looking at you know some form of filtration, which you can get um, you know dust filters that you can fit to you know the um, the entrance to the to the uh, to the injector if if you need to as well. Um, another point of advice would be you know with any with any filtration of gases, then the final filtration should be close to the point of use to avoid it, any pickup of, of anything in the system. Because obviously anything, any impurities that are in the gas are gonna end up in your wine. So, and ultimately we're all trying to, trying to protect that as best we can. So one method of using compressed air is to use it in a pump over system. So this is an example of a, a sinter and a pump over line. So that's the same pump over line that we had the, the Venturi injector installed on. Um, so this gave us a really effective aeration of the wine. So we had compressed air uh, going onto the side of the, um, onto the side of the sinter. In this instance, it was a, um, a tube sinter, so stainless steel um, sintered tube, which then had the, the gas on the outside um, and allowed for the, the wine to flow through the middle of it. Um, obviously not having anything impeding in the, the wine flow. If there's any skins or seeds, they don't get caught or um, block the line, making life a lot easier. Um, so one of the considerations with this is that we basically had to time uh, these with the pump overs. Um, obviously, you know, that the, the nice thing about that is that we reduce the amount of air we're adding um, during the, the ferment as it goes on longer as we reduce the, the frequency of the pump over. Um, but one of the downsides of, of these, these centers is that they are prone to blockage. So as, um, as ferments go on, we we're tending to find that we were, we we're getting uh, blockages in the center. Um, one advantage of this is that obviously you can isolate it, pull it out, clean it and get it back in. Um, but that's 
you know, there's a fair bit of, of work involved in that compared to if you've just got a, something sitting in the, the bottom of a tank, it's a lot harder to try and, try and pull that out while you're in the middle of fermentation. Um, sinters in tank, so that's another option if you've just got a, a, a gas sparging sinter, which a lot of wineries would typically have for any sort of gas adjustment. Um, these can be really effective for aerating the wine as well. Um, they can either be continuous or periodic. So whether you're lining them up with pump over timing, uh, whether you've got you know, a certain amount you want to put in per, per day, um, then you, know, you, can, you can line these up uh, that way. Once again, like the, um, like the one on the pump over line, where you've got those fine fermentation solids, they do tend to grow in the pores of the, um, of the center. So that is something to be, to be aware of. Um, I typically find if you fit a valve to enable cleaning during fermentation, then you can easily um, remove it, clean it, and, um, and move on uh, to, the, um, to get it, back in, get it back in play. There are other options, including continuous injection. So I talked about periodically doing it. Um, there has been some, some work to show that continuously adding a smaller amount of air throughout the ferment um, can be more effective than period, periodic additions of the same amount. And I guess this is a bit like temperature control of the fermentation as well, where you can keep everything moving along at a nice steady rate, you'll typically have a, have a better outcome. Um, this can either be through a sinter or an orifice. Obviously a sinter will give you a finer, finer bubble, um, but we've also found success with just small orifices that are then less prone to, to blocking. So one of, the, one of the critical things to understand what we're, what we're doing is obviously being able to measure what we're doing. So one of the nice advantages in using a compressed air source is having um, a flow meter so then we can measure the volumes going in. Um, obviously uh, that helps us understand the amount that we're adding so we can fine tune it, um, but also understanding process issues. So a visual um, flow meter like these are quite useful because if you know that they're meant to be running and the little uh, flow bobbin drops, um, then you know you might have an issue like a, a block center or a, or a block line or a, typically you'll know if you've got a compressed air failure. Um, one thing as far as measuring goes, we found was that trying to measure the dissolved oxygen in the, the wine is really challenging. Um, and redox uh, can provide much more insight on the addition, but I'll leave this with Roger to discuss. And I've had a, a couple of discussions on this, on this topic with him and I've always left feeling very enlightened. Um, moving on to, to the next stages is automating the process. Um, obviously, if you automate it, it enables you to set and forget. Just don't actually forget it though. You will want to turn it off towards the end of the fermentation, um, unless you want to set up your uh, system with a full you know, recipe batch management type system. Um, by doing that, it enables you to minimize the, the additional labor that these systems might take. Um, it also enables you to maintain consistency between ferments so you know the job's been done. It makes it much easier to track um, and review performance on different, different fermenters, different fermentations. Um, by being able to uh, automate it, it then gives you the option to be able to gather that data automatically rather than rely on people once again to take that and then look for trends and, and differences between fermentations. Um, and obviously, yeah, if you can link this in with, with something like a redox measurement, um, then you can use that to drive uh, the process automation as well. Uh, so one of the um, challenges we had was rotary fermenters. So these are typically reductive. Um, we've always had a lot of challenges with these. Uh, we've we even had small little air bubblers set up on, on these systems, but that we just found that the amount of air they're adding just wasn't enough. Um, now trying to add air to these systems manually is really labor intensive. Um, because you're having to manually connect systems onto a, a rotating vessel that then requires locking them out to make sure they don't you know, start rotating while they've got hoses connected to them. Um, obviously, when you want to add air to them, you want them to be upright so that the vents open um, because otherwise, if you're trying to add particularly compressed air into a closed vessel, these are not designed to do that and will not go well for you. And so for us, we've automated these. So in this instance, we've got um, an additional path through the, through the brine collector on the rotary coupling at the end. Um, and so this has enabled us to get air um, through a flow meter and using a solenoid to, to control with process control. 
um, to enable us to get the air through into the, the bottom of the vessel. That then goes through a, through a manifold, which has got a small orifice uh, in place, which then enables us to effectively um, add oxygen or add air to the system to um, really make some big improvements in, um, in the ferments that we're getting out of those vessels. And that's all from me. I'd like to thank everyone for their time. Um, and Matt, I'll hand back over to you. Thanks, Luke. That was that was good. Um, there was just one comment. I might make a quick comment now. There was a comment on um, uh, whether um, air has been added to white ferments. Look, there is a few um, people are going to touch on adding air to white ferments throughout their presentations today, but we might cover off on that um, with some questions in the Q and A session uh, at the end. All right. Thanks, Luke. No right. Thank you. Our next presenter this morning is Jeremy Nassenman. Jeremy is a senior winemaker from Calabria Family Wines in the Riverina in New South Wales. And Jeremy uh, holds a double degree in enology and viticulture. He's made wine in both the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. And he has over 15 years experience in this space. Jeremy works with fruit from various regions across Australia, including the Brossa, Riverina, Hilltops, Canberra and Tumbarumba. And he's gonna detail to, um, to the group today how he uses aeration in his winemaking. So Jeremy, if I could just get you to jump off mute and share your yep. screen. How's that? Perfect, excellent, thank you. Right okay. So hey guys, so I'm just going to go through today um, pretty much how we've been using air um, and sort of our perspective on why and where and how. Um, so just give you a bit of background. So we're a 10,000 ton winery based in the Griffith in the Riverina. Um, obviously our main fruit source is, you know, with irrigated inland fruit, but we also dabble in a bit of Barossa, a bit of Canberra, Tom Rubber and Hilltop. So we're dealing with, you know, diverse climates in regards to fruit intake. Um, sort of the main focus with our aeration is basically on red, red, red fermentation. So red fermenter sizes range from, you know, as small as three tonne with premium parcels up to, you know, 185 tonne. Um, and our sort of fermenters are a mix of, you know, traditional static fermenters, open top and closed, um, sweeping arm fermenters, as well as open top concrete wax line fermenters as well. So obviously, as mentioned before, the main aeration techniques that we usually use is mainly performed on red ferments and to a lesser extent on some white juice handling, such as, you know, hyperoxin, pinot gris juice, and um, as well as Chardonnay juice to make, you know, bigger, richer styles of Chardonnay. Um, the why, so the main reason for us with using aeration um, was born out of excessive reduction in red ferments, especially with, you know, some of our inland irrigated fruit due to the fact that, you know, we have low to moderate yams from pastures that are usually on the higher end of the, you know, on higher end of the yield limits. Um, the other limiting factor was for me personally, I prefer to use as little as possible, um, things like that. Um, we do use a fair bit of organic nitrogen in the winery during fermentation, but, you know, I have a bit of a thing with that. Um, you know, although it is beneficial and, you know, use it sparingly, it does have its drawbacks, you know, things like its heat spikes during fermentation, you increase increasing fermentation kinetics, so sometimes when you want, you know, pass the fruit to sit on skins for a certain length of time to try and draw it as much nice as possible, can be a bit of a, bit of a ball breaker. Um, excessive, um, highly degradable, simple ester formation, such as the oscillam acetate. So within six months, you're seeing a large drop in, um, you know, wine's fruitiness, which comes from that. And, uh, you know, from personally, I think there's also a palate hardness when you, you know, use excessive amounts of DAP as well. Um, so after the first couple of harvest periods of use, aeration throughout the rhino was vastly expanded. So we probably started using air in about 2013. Um, and then has, you know, we've, we've vastly expanded not long after. Um, just because we've seen, you know, over time ourselves, improvements in, you know, red wine palate expansion, depth and softness, fruit lifts and also fruit complexity, which you think is to do with aeration involved in during fermentation with the, with the yeast. And also colour stability over time was the biggest thing for us, you know, because we're dealing with fruit that is on the higher end of the yield spectrum. So um, colour stability is an issue, especially when we've got the addition of sulphur post, post malo. Um, so after seeing all these first team results, we began to, you know, delve into the theory of why. And you know, although the, the, there's limited amount of theory about, more and more research has, you know, been stating of it. So, 
we've been we found you know with O2 exposure, these purple monomeric anthocyanins become more stable and resistant to sulfur bleaching by directly or indirectly forming polymers with condensed tannins, as well as acid aldehyde mediated derivatives such as pyranoanthocyanins. So this induces a change from red to orange hues and lowers wine astringency, as these anthocyanin bound tannins tend to be less astringent and than the non-pigmented tannins, which we found to actually happen. Um, it also has, you know, a considerable impact on fermentation kinetics, uh, most, most usually in whites, not so much in reds. Um, with this addition, you know, either through passive addition, such as pumping over or direct injection, being the most, you know, most likely the most effective method of controlling and accelerating fermentation. Um, also, recent studies involving aeration of reds during fermentation, you know, you get these stylistic changes associated with tannin structure and decreases in reductive characters, particularly as wines age. Is also being observed as you'd expect. Um, preliminary results from a couple of studies also suggest that a single well timed, short duration, high intensity aeration doesn't usually pack the same amount of punch or power as other modes of delivery. So we're sort of more in that space of repeated long, low intensity aerations, which tend to find work better. And oxygen also favours the synthesis of sterols and unsaturated fatty acids, which are vitally improving you know, cell membrane permeability and hence sugar penetration of the cell, which is to do with fermentation health. Um, the only thing we sort of have found, you've got to really take caution when you're adding compromised fruit due to the excessive oxidation um, facilitated by, by lacase. Um, should be okay during the active parts of ferment, but you've got to be really careful towards probably the second half to the last third of fermentation where you sort of got your yeast cell population starting to wane back down. Um, there's a bit of a paradox, which you know you read a lot of um, research papers. You know, adding air accelerates fermentation rates, which theoretically cause higher nitrogen demand for yeast, you know, per bome, but also at the same time oxidizes H2S. So, a lot of the studies do sort of state these kind of things, but in our opinion, um, air is definitely a good thing. So, for when when we add air, so for me the most crucial timing is. It's from fermentation commencement. So as soon as you've got active you know, bubbles forming in your ferment, um, through to about two thirds sugar depletion, as by then the yeast cell population is starting to waver due to alcohol, you know, alcohol building. Um, the most opportune time is just as the fermentation kicks off during the growth phase and diminishes as the ferment progresses. Reason being as the alcohol and other toxic metabolites build, as you expect, it hinders nitrogen uptake, which is becoming the limiting factor. Studies have also suggested that we should be looking at an o for an O2 saturation during each event, that's 68 ppm DO, even though we don't really measure it. That's what we roughly be looking for. Um, and you get very little problems, as Luke mentioned before, very little problems in regards to overdoing it when talking about white juices or red ferments. As in active red ferments, you've got plenty of yeast that are able to absorb and mop up large amounts of excess oxygen. And in white juices, all the flavor compounds are safely bound up sugars. So allowing effective softening, broadening of palate structure, you know, with, with fuller bodied Chardonnay or, you know, color removal with, with Pinot Gris juices. Um, and the one thing I'd like to mention too is downsides to just relying on passive pumping over aerations as an aeration technique is that two things. One, it's not independent of extraction, which, you know, can be a bit annoying when you need to add air, um, but then your wine's already probably a bit through with, with, uh, with extraction as well as the fact that it's adding relatively little amounts of, of, of O2 to, to your ferment. And then how we measure, we're pretty rudimentary here. Um, it's basically, we taste ferments, you know, two, three times a day, um, seeing how they're, they're evolving. And we just pretty much work all that from there. It's been trial and error a couple of years. So we would like to measure things more, um, more numerically, but at the moment we don't really have that sort of um, set up here at the winery. Um, so how we sort of um, aerate our ferment. So our major sort of technique is via sparger with sinters. Um, it's cheap, quick and effective. Um, the reason we use sinter is because we're getting smaller air bubbles. So we're getting um, higher efficiency for the amount of air that we're adding. Um, if we're using larger bubbles, they tend to run through the ferment and sort of pop out the top and are uh, less, less dissolved into, into the actual um, liquid. We also do like um, like a tub aeration with an angled tray or like a cheese grater type thing on there. So as, as Luke showed before in his pictures, and I'll show a few pictures after as well, 
You also have uh, pulse air ability as well here at the Wine Air, either a static inbuilt system or handheld unit. Um, the only problem with this, like with, with um, adding air during pumping over, it's not necessarily independent of extraction, which can be a bit annoying sometimes. And other options we've been looking at and would like to do in the future, things like rack and return. Obviously, we need a bit more setup with the rotary screen or in-tank screening. And as Luke mentioned before, also, you know, it's a pretty labour intensive, but it can, um, can get pretty good uh, results with extraction. Um, and also, instead of having the um, pump over set up where you're pumping over the skins, try and have a different inlet that can be isolated and put underneath the cap. So you, when you can, you can actually aerate via pumping over underneath the cap. So you're actually starting to become um, independent of extraction when needed. So our equipment, we've got an air compressor feed obviously through the one which most people have. Um, we're feeding in at about 12 meters cubed per minute. It's an eight mil feed line. We have 120 micro, micro sparge sinters and we have a seven bar feed holding tank, which holds about 10,000 litres of air. So we aren't going to be running out of air you know, during our busiest time in the red fermentation period. And some examples of what we're doing, we're probably putting about four hours worth of aeration over a 24 hour period for like 185 tonne ferments and about 45 minutes per, uh, per day for about five tonne ferments on average. So uh, these pictures here are showing how we sort of add our air to the ferment. So you can see here on the left, there's a sweeping R fermenter with a sparge on the rack arm. Um, and then on the right, we've got, a, we've got a static fermenter with a similar kind of setup. So we can actually isolate and um, aerate independently of, of pumping over, which is for me one of the, one of the major, major points. Um, we also have some tanks with these built-in rings on the bottom of the tank which are you know, similar to the kind of things you have in your, um, your, your culture tanks when you're making up yeast. Um, they're quite handy. The only problem is they're harder to clean because they're harder to remove. And obviously all our air that's fed into our ferments uh, uh, is filtered with food grade filters to ensure we're getting no contaminants into, into the ferments. Um, and this is, well, as I was speaking before, just a simple schematic of an aeration via tub, as Luke showed before in his slides as well, with an angled tray to increase the surface area between the liquid and, and the atmospheric air to try and get as much oxygen as possible. So the other option for us would be to try and instead of doing it over on the pump over, we want to try and get any, uh, another sort of line in fed underneath the cap so we can then aerate independent of, of pumping over. The only problem with that would be then you have to ensure that certain ferment sizes are in certain tanks, which can be a bit difficult. Um, now, lastly, our pulse air. So um, these pieces of equipment are relatively cheap. Um, you can get um, portable options or you can get built-in setups. I've used both um, at, at various wineries. They're very handy for, for extraction as well. Um, they can um, effectively churn over your cap. Um, but again, the amount of air that's, that's being put in the fermentation is minimal to when compared to using things like sinters because the bubbles are smaller. Um, but yeah, they're actually quite effective. So in the end of the day, it's better than adding none at all. So um, they can give, is actually a relatively useful option. So finishing up, just the take home messages, things, uh, aeration is, you know, it's an effective tool to reduce reduction. For me, it improves phenolic expansion on the palate, um, reduces phenolic hardness, and really improves that red wine color and sulfur stability um, over time. No, it's relatively cheap and easy to implement if you have the equipment already available, which most people do have air compressors set up in their winery for, as I said before, with, with your bag presses. Um, it tends to improve fermentation kinetics, especially in whites, and keep the yeast happy. And as, as repeated before, repeated long, low intensity aerations are best than, you know, um, big, big hits only once or twice a day. Um, there's very little problems in usually um, overdoing it as well. Don't be scared. Um, when you're talking about white juices or red ferments. Um, and that's about it, guys. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. I'll just get you to stop sharing there. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, comes from uh, UC California, UC Davis, California. It's uh, Professor Roger Bolton. Um, he will be presenting on 
redox probes and the control of redox potential during wine fermentations. Roger is very well known in the wine industry right across the world and has a very long list of honours and awards in enology and viticulture. He's investigated and researched the topic of aeration and brings his considerable experience and knowledge to today's workshop. So thanks uh, for joining us this morning, uh, afternoon time in California this morning here in Australia, Roger. So I'll just pass over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, one pleased to be part of this group and part of this conversation and um, look forward to the Q&A. Um, so I was asked if I would specifically address redox probes and that's what I want to do. So let's go through the case there. Um, sorry, are you advancing or am I advancing? There we go. So what I want to try and cover is what is electrode potential when we stick an electrode and we, we call it redox. In the old world, it would be called redox potential. The modern world nomenclature becomes electrode potential. So same thing, just terminology. You'd also see it in wastewater and other applications where people talk about ORP, oxidative reduction potential. So those are essentially an element measuring a potential at a liquid element interface. We can come back to that later. So we buy a thing called a um, redox electrode, um, platinum in glass with a reference in a solution. And we compare the potential in the liquid we're in with the difference relative to the standard in the electrode. And some of the old ones would be color mill today. They could be silver chloride, whatever the configuration is, but it's essentially an electrode like, a, like you'd have a, um, a temperature probe and it would sit in the tank. And the question is whereabouts to put it and what's going to give you. Our concern is it's got to be food grade. So we'll come to that in a minute. Um, some considerations of where you'd put it and uh, how it is to clean and so forth. Um, how it's controlled, we'll come back to that. Um, what value should you be controlling at? Because this is something that's a scale we're not familiar with. Um, some examples of research and commercial fermentations and um, we've already heard some about the, the values. Um, I threw out some other questions trying to get you to think about what was the Q&A session, but the first one is what are we actually measuring? We'll address that in Q&A. Um, what's determining the value of the potential in juice and wine? We can handle that in Q&A. How do we interpret it? I'll give you some examples now, but we can talk further. Um, why is redox potential different from dissolved oxygen? It'll become very clear and very important as we go through this. We actually don't need a lot of the oxygen we put in. Most of it has no effect on redox. All we're really after is the first half to one milligram per liter dissolved oxygen. As we'll see in Q&A, the limiting factor is not the oxygen. The limiting factor is complexes in the wine, which will turn it to peroxide. And having more and more oxygen doesn't change that. So we'll come back to that one later. And some response time and variation, how frequent to do it, how much to do it, those will fall into play, I hope, as we go forward. So we've typically had experience both small scale and large scale with Hamilton probes. They're designed for pharmaceutical use. Um, in the US, uh, the uh, material used in the O-rings had to be food grade compliant and Food Drug Administration in the United States. Um, so there is many industrial ones for wastewater and for water systems. The question is, are they food grade? And that's why we go back to the Hamilton ones. So they're a glass electrode. We put them in a stainless sleeve to protect them and we mount them on the tank. And I'll come back. There's one actually just over my shoulder right here in the behind me. Um, these things have got um, standard instrument interfaces. This one happens to be Modbus. These things come with Bluetooth options. That's all nice. Um, the question is you want to get the data out and you want to be able to put it into a control loop and you want to be able to control the redox potential. So you want to measure it, you want to do something, and you want to see whether what you did gave you what you wanted. And uh, we'll come back in Q&A later. So this is an example of what that thing looks like. Um, Notice that it's filled with a liquid and it has a bubble. So the thing has to be mounted vertically or 45 degrees. You can't put it horizontal. That's one of the problems with this particular model. However, 45 degrees, as you can see behind me again, is OK and it works and is, meets the condition. Um, we clean it before and in each, between fermentations. So we put it in the tank, we fill the tank, 
we conduct the fermentation at the end when we're cleaning the equipment, most other things, we take it out and clean it, recalibrate it. We go to the lab to recalibrate it against the reference solution, and then we come back and put it in the tank and off we go again. Um, this is what it looks like. You can see here, this is the data transmission end for a Modbus cable or for Bluetooth. Um, the main electrode is this section here, and it's protected by this sleeve. This one has a triclover fitting or sanitary fitting at the bottom, and it has these little prongs to protect the glass element. But essentially, it's you could we don't want to put this inside the tank because we're going to drop the skin cap. What we like to do is put it adjacent to the wall in a 45 degree, and we'll come back to that. So here's an example on the right hand side um, into a standard uh, port, 45 degrees, up at an angle, data cable and Bluetooth. So these um, come in various ranges. They're, um, the interfacing is standard for a guy that's an instrument person who would look at this. Um, it's really the FDA compliance that we've been chasing as a food grade option. You've probably got similar codes in Australia that would say you need to be this. But this is a platinum electrode. So as long as we keep using platinum electrodes as our references, um, the scales will use be the same. And so here I've got on the left hand side, you can see a 45 pretty clearly. And here it is uh, on the side. It doesn't protrude a lot compared to other fittings we've got on the tank. Uh, sits in the side. This is probably about a third of the way up the tank. So we've got a half full tank. We can still follow redox. And back to um, Jeremy's comment and uh, other comments earlier now, is if we were to sparge the floor of this tank with an open tube, we would see an able to roll below a skin cap. We would see it because the probe is right there. And if it was a white, we would see it as well. So this is a almost a uniform place to put it for reds or whites, um, no matter what our practice of addition is. So here's the tank. Um, the floor of the tank is across the bottom here. You can see this is about a third height. Uh, this would be half height tanks. Um, and now all of the fermenters, the 14 big fermenters we have here at school, are all fitted in this way. So the, the trials were, the first time we were able to do um, research publishable trials was uh, 2017, and I'll talk about that. There's been some other studies on whites were done in 2018 harvest. Um, there's some red trials at the um, 10,000 litre fermenter in the 2020 harvest. There's um, um, Probe. These were wall mounted, one was surface mounted, um, another one where it's actually floating in a skin cap with a little float and a punch down, um, uh, whole, it's not somewhat whole berry um, Pinot fermentation, 300 litres. And then um, this year we just finished a trial which was at 100, 100 litres in small fermenters, uh, 1,000, the ones behind me, and uh, 10,000 commercially at a commercial winery. The important thing was this was from the same batch of grapes. So this was demonstrating across scale about the ability to control a different scale in the very same juice conditions. Um, what do we want to control it at? Um, I'll throw out a number and we'll just say 200 millivolts for right now. What we don't want is it get to 100 or 50 or zero. If you, if you looked at um, chemical reaction equations, there's two things going on. One is once we get down to about zero to minus 50 millivolts, elemental sulfur wants to be kinetically in the form of some H2S. So if we can stay away from that reaction zone, we never will get H2S from elemental sulfur, which is a major problem in fermentations. The yeast in that example aren't making the sulfide. The yeast are pushing the redox potential down, which is what's causing a physical chemical reaction of elemental sulfur residue that produces the sulfide. And so there's a lot of confusion there about yeast strains doing that. And the answer is no, these yeast strains are producing the redox to drop quicker and earlier and therefore cause more of a problem. They're not making it, they're creating the environment which is actually causing the problem. Is that clear? So wait for Q&A, there'll be a lot of that. So this was an attempt to demonstrate that you could control redox above a limit and how well it oscillates or how constant or how spiky just gets back to how you set up your control system and what the gain settings are. But David Colleen's work's the first one. It was done with little sparges, 100 micron uh, sparges here, um, going into a fermenter, um, 
We were using uh, an epoxy ORP probe at that point in a standard lab pH meter, uh, millivolt meter, and being able to pull the signal. Looking for the signal to drop to a certain millivolts, we would activate the solenoid and we would add air. And so we would add air and a pulse for a period of time. We would stop, we would see the signal, and that was um, that gave us the ability to control over 200 millivolts through the entire fermentation. That's David's work that's published in AJV in 2018. Here's the setup with the little flow tubes, a little solenoid, a little control box, each of the millivolt meters and the corresponding pump over control meters that we use in our fermentations. The tanks were like this. So this is the red skin cap. We typically do bricks measurements and pump overs by using a double screen that sits on the floor. So now when we go down here, we can do pump overs internally. And this was the same arrangement, except the electrode was sitting in here on a little floating styrofoam disc. So it was basically measuring the liquid below the skin cap is where it was sitting and we would add air into this one and it would have to diffuse and get mixed to show up on the electrode over here okay now this is probably um, maybe 10 centimeters um, not a long way away but these are small research scale but let's look at what happens so the red curve is the standard control condition the standard reference condition of this fermentation the blue is the one where we've added pulsed air to actually keep the redox above 200. The two characteristics are, if you did the derivative of those curves, um, this is the maximum fermentation rate, which is about uh, six bricks a day. The very same juice, no nutrient change, the very same temperature, the shifting of the redox results in a condition which is more like eight bricks a day. Okay, and it's a bit delayed, but more important is not just the rate, it's the fact that it actually probably finishes to dryness in about six days. Whereas the same juice under well mixed conditions would have uh, been more sluggish to be at least eight to 10 days before it leveled off. So there's, a, there's an issue of tailing that's eliminated if we could control the redox. So here's the blue line is the redox control. Notice that when we give it a pulse of air, the millivolts change by about 200 vertically. So we go from about 220 up to about 400, 420. And that occurs in the time scale we'll look at in just a minute. But typically it reaches a peak and then it decays away again. And it gets down to 200, not down to what it would normally be, but down to 200 within about four hours. So the real question is, could you keep on giving it a small dose every four hours? Part of what Luke was referring to is a more lower continuous, Gary may refer to as well, is we don't need five milligrams or three milligrams oxygen. We actually don't as dissolved. What we need is a very small amount periodically. And what we're trying to give you here is an example of how frequent would that be. We can talk again Q&A whether that's really the case. So focus on the fact that um, just by controlling the redox above 200, we would believe we will never get H2S production. Um, now we're able to get the tailing piece of a red fermentation uh, much more consistent and early by nothing more than adding air. This is the same data, but it's stretched out a little bit. And this is the pulsing showing when the solenoid fires off. But if you look at this, um, the rise in redox occurs almost immediately. Again, this is a day scale. so. From here to here, this is um, 12 hours across here. There's one, two, three, almost four of these in the 12 hour period. I say three to four hours. It takes up, comes down. But of that, in less than an hour, it's up to full redox. So adding the air, producing the peroxide, as we'll see in a minute, having it mixed, getting to the probe is within uh, an hour. And now the question is, that will continue to be eroded by, as we'll see in a minute, glutathione production from yeast. And now the question will come down to 200, we'll say give it another pulse. So this is the dynamics you'd wanna be able to try to put into a control system, either on a timer or on a control loop. We'll come back to the Q and A, but notice that it's um, turning on between four and eight times a day, depending on slows down a bit towards the end. Same addition goes up to 350, 
uh, but we'll see later. Most of the growth and the important piece of redox is in this the first half, like uh, I think Jeremy alluded to. When we actually take those two curves and we fit them in a fermentation model for, to interpret, what jumped out was what was surprising. So two of the things that are in this model is the maintenance rate, which is the fermentation rate occurring by non-growing cells. And that'll occur once yeast growth is stopped. The tail half is very dependent on the maintenance rate of the non-growing cells. The second feature that affects that is the viability of those cells. That is how quickly they're dying off. And so when we run the condition, the two things that come out of the model is that the maintenance rate is about three times higher in this example. All things being equal, we change their maintenance rate by simply controlling the early growth condition they grew in compared to letting it float. The second is the viability, which is a viability constant um, in, don't worry about the units of them, but in this example is significantly larger. This is a denominator term. That means the viability is high longer. It's not dying off quickly. That'd be a 14. This is a 21. It's much more. So the control of redox unexpectedly, completely without any precedent, seems to be affecting resting cell behavior and viability. And that's stunning. And it's critical. And yet it's half our fermentation. And that's why the tail is so affected by controlling redox at 200. After that, we did this trial where we did a surface float. So we put the probe into a little styrofoam box. We dangled it down and just suspended it to the top of a, a white fermenting juice. Um, that fermentation curve looks like this. Um, here's the Brick's curve. Um, sort of like Bome, but the different. I'm just joking. Um, the yellow curve is the one I want you to follow. So notice that the potential in this example was started up around 200 millivolts. Um, it dropped naturally. By this point, it's hit zero millivolts. Okay. And that is occurring before there's maybe two or three bricks dropped. What we look for in these curves is the minimum. When does it plateau off at the minimum? Because the minimum redox condition in a fermenting culture is characteristic of the end of growth. And people have known this since 1920s. This is not new stuff. But the point is, if you were not controlling it, you'd want to know where that point was. So just monitoring redox will be instructive. What we would like to do is actually intervene so it doesn't get down to zero and doesn't get to this point because we don't want the sulfide production piece of it. And it seems that if we start early enough, like I think both Jeremy and Luke referred to, you can have the effect on the viability on the non-growing cells. This is an example with a punch down. Uh, so every time they're doing a punch down, you can see um, uh, once or twice a day, there's a spike in we, we the potentials are hanging around minus 100 naturally in Pinot, hot roaring fermentation. Um, when they punch down twice a day, it'll get up to zero, but then almost immediately it'll drop down again. So did it do something? Yes. And the answer is no, not long enough, not enough to have an effect. When we bubbled air in two different sparging arrangements and kept it from, um, from minus 50 up to just below a, a zero, and in this example could get it up from zero to 50, these were trials to try to understand sparger size and bubbling. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. But the point is that the effect of a pump over splashing and the effect of a punch down is very short lived. And the problem is then you go back to reductive conditions and that's you'll get the same. So it won't eliminate the sulfides. It's the keeping it elevated uh, that's the important factor. Um, this is now running at um, small scale on the left is 100 litre. These were at 1,000 litre. And then the 10,000 litre was the trial we just finished this year in this size tank. So it's not new stuff. It's old. Um, but Jocelyn has a paper, only one of the early professors here at Davis has a paper on redox during fermentation in 49. That's uh, 70 odd years ago. I know some people that are knocking on the door. Shandul has a book in 59 on the microbiology that shows it. Bryce Rankin spends six months in Geisenheim 
he gets his ideas about measuring redox potential in fermentations in the paper that's in 63 from his studies in Geisenheim. And Berevec did some work recently. So here's the BRICS curve. Here's the potential curve from um, uh, Joslin. Uh, today, we would look at that curve and say about 100 hours in, um, you're at about um, 10 bricks, nine bricks is at the end of yeast growth. That's what that curve tells us. And um, that's an insight that would not be obviously easy in a red, let alone in a white. This happens to be a white. So this is Shandell's book. Um, they used a different scale, a thing called an RH scale. It's related to the redox potential in a roundabout way, but we don't rely on that today and it's not particularly useful, but it was an attempt to allow for pH effects on redox. The point is, think of this as millivolts. And he's looking at the decline in the millivolts that occur with time as the fermentation begins, what it drops down to, and a zone that they thought was the ideal zone that wine should be in. So they're talking redox zones for fermentation and storage back in 59. What's really interesting, and, and Jeremy touched on it, is people used to think that if you gave air to juices, you would reduce sterols and you would reduce the lag phase and you would get them started. What if I said to you that is nothing more than a redox effect? So his Shandul, he's adding, um, well, these are upside down fermentation curves. These are grams of CO2 evolved. Notice this one takes off almost straight away. This one has about three days lag, and this one has about four and a half days lag. They're all in the same juice. The only difference is one was at 391 millivolts, one was at 320, and one was at 270. Now, if ever there's an example of redox effect affecting lag time and initiation, this has got to be it. But if you didn't measure redox, you would attribute that to aeration. So you can see how the two things are getting confused. You aerated and you got this effect. Um, that's true, but it wasn't the air. It was the air's effect on the redox that really did it. This is Rankin's paper, um, 1963. He's looking at um, BOME disappearance. He's looking at the maximum fermentation rate of CO2. He's looking at the H2S production peak. Notice the peak of H2S production in regard to the maximum fermentation rate. And notice the minimum of redox potential. And you tell me now why the redox potential curve is so important to understand H2S production and um, fermentation performance. So this is when you drop below 100 on his millivolt scale, corrected for, for other conditions. Um, so the question is, we don't want to get to fermentations which are down below 100, because if, if the propensity is to produce H2S is going to be there. So hence, can we keep them up in this zone? That's 1963, long time ago. This is the work of Berevec, it's more recent. He's actually showing fermentation curves and redox. Notice the redox levels off in this example, which is at 15. Um, notice that it levels off at um, minus 100. Here it levels off at about zero. Here it falls at to minus 100 at 18. When he ferments at 24, notice it levels off at about 200 millivolts. So there's a temperature effect on the speed of fermentation, which is driving the redox lower. And in the case of reds, we're going to ferment faster and hotter, we're actually going to push the potentials lower. This is Sauvignon Blanc. Here's the focus on cab. Notice the potential here is at 100 at 18. When he gets to uh, 26, which would be cool compared to some fermentations, which might get up to 30 or 32. Notice the redox potential is minus 250. Okay, so hot fermentation reds have that potential to go so negative, what we're trying to do is get it up here and keep it zigzagging up here so it never gets to this potential and therefore would never produce H2S and therefore would have a more complete tail. Does that make sense? It is the potential that's driving these conditions. So let me stop there. Um, we can have lots of questions, but um, let's finish the other presentations and we'll come back to Q&A. 
what I wanted you to think about was um, the ability now to simply put in a tube below the skin cap and roll a juice like uh, Jeremy was referring to. It can be an open tube. It doesn't need to be a sparger. It doesn't have the cleaning problems. It can be taken in or out. Now do you want to deliver compressed air or air on a timer? And do you want to set it for every three or four hours? Because that would be a start for next harvest. Or can you implement a redox probe, put it into the wall of a tank, decide on where to put your sparger and build a control loop to control redox? And so anything but doing what you're currently doing would be a step forward. And those would be the two possibilities to quickly adopt. Um, hope that's good for now. Let's move to Q&A. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Roger. Thanks, Roger. That was great. Um, if I could just ask the presenters to just to um, uh, stop their video, um, stop their videos uh, for this next presentation, because this next one's a recorded one, that'd be fantastic. Um, our next presenter is uh, Antonio Denisi. Um, he's our last presenter today. He's the senior winemaker at Windowry Wines in Cowandindra, which is located between Orange and Cowra in New South Wales. Anthony's a fourth generation winemaker and has made wines both in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. Anthony's gonna take us through how he approaches aeration during his fermentation from a practical uh, point of view. So we will just press play. Hi there, um, this is the Windowry Wines Aeration Experience. My name's Antonio Denisi. Um, so I guess uh, I was asked to um, present what we do as far as oxygen uh, aerating uh, red ferments. Um, so a little bit about my background experience. Um, uh, my experience uh, in winemaking started off with uh, managing a closed and open red static ferments. Uh, we manage these with pump overs and delastage with every pump over twice a day. Um, later on, uh, my experience evolved to me being involved in a, uh, in a cooperative in Chablis in France, Le Chablis Dien, um, and I better benefited from uh, experiencing open red static fermenters, uh, and more importantly, um, oxygen ingress uh, into all white wines, and that happened at precisely 1080 density. So that's about 12 and a, uh, sorry, 10 and a half to 11 bone, which I thought was quite interesting. Post that, um, in the brosser, I experienced um, some pulse air, large rotary fermenters, which we all know are hugely um, anaerobic. Um, and then on top of that, um, since being in this position, we've always utilised international vintage experience. And many of the inter visiting international winemakers continued to comment that we required more air during ferment, um, particularly our red. So it was at this stage where uh, I started to really question whether um, I needed to evolve and also, uh, you know, Australian winemaking may needed to have evolved in this respect. Um, why did we decide to aerate? Well, um, obviously there was that, that feedback from the visiting international winemakers, but the clear drivers for change were the un, was the undesirable H2S production that we were experiencing um, negative mouthfeel aspects, uh, so this was viticulture and also clonal derived, um, and uh, we have a need to manage parallel production with our conventional winemaking, but also our organic winemaking. Um, so yeah, just needed to find a better way to manage um, H2S in particular regarding our organics. So um, how, do we, how do I mitigate H2S with limited DAP use? and zero use of copper on our organic wines. Uh, so that was my big question. Um, so when I, you know, when we recognized we had to address this problem a different way, I decided to seriously consider oxygen, um, aerating our red ferments. And uh, this was, uh, you know, a, a critical part of us uh, moving forward and developing that wine style. Um, I didn't start off with just applying air uh, or oxygen. Um, I did do some research to work out um, how I'm best going about this, but also how much we might need to try and, you know, um, uh, air out our reds. Um, so through that research, um, we 
or I was able to identify that through, uh, you know, that there are different techniques of aerating. Um, much literature indicated that open pump overs, so pump overs through an open tub, um, actually did very little to introduce enough oxygen. Um, there was also the, the, the easily, you know, easy option of cracking a suction or venturing on the suction side of the pump during a pump over, and this was good. Um, but you know, m much of the time, the people who manage our pump overs are inexperienced. Um, it is a simple task. Um, and I question how I would control the amount of air um, going into e each ferment without being there and supervising the start of every pump over. So that was less a less desirable approach for, for us. Um, and through further research, I did note that literature did identify the rate of oxygen, which was beneficial to yeast health and viability, as well as reduce green characters and tannins, i.e. mouthfeel. So, um, you know, that was stated in a, um, you know, in milligrams per litre. So I had a sort of, you know, I had an amount of oxygen that I needed to dissolve into the wine um, that, I'm, you know, was uh, something to aim for. So from that, um, I was able to uh, develop a, a very basic cheat sheet, uh, but one that I still refer to occasionally or ask, um, you know, um, vintage winemakers to refer to when they're making decisions. So this is the, this is the basic um, oxygen application table sheet that I've made. Um, I've, you know, it's easily decipherable. I've got tank volumes across the top, um, the rate of uh, milligrams per litre of oxygen required, and then how many litres of oxygen that then equates to, so we know um, how many litres of oxygen we need to apply to that volume. Um, and then further down the next table, so the part B is then based on the litres per minute through a flow meter, for example, um, how many minutes each tank then requires for the respective uh, oxygen rates. Uh, then there's a bit of a calculation down the bottom. Um, this calculation was, was a little difficult to work out and I may not have actually worked it out um, entirely precisely because the rate of oxygen required is in milligrams per litre um, and I uh, yeah I had to then work out in a litre of pure oxygen gas what would then be the you know the the weight of that I guess or you know the, the amount of oxygen so um, that involved a, a number of online calculators but I, um, based on um, what we've experienced um, with what our rates are um, that sort of 2.5 uh, to 10 or equating to um, two and a half litres per minute to 10 litres a minute is about right. Um, so the, the next question is, so we've worked out what, um, you know, uh, how to go about aerating or, you know, looked at different options. We've looked at the rate of oxygen that we require uh, per litre of wine. Um, but now the question is, how do we effectively apply that amount? So when dairy has 12, 20 and 40 ton static fermenters, um, they've traditionally been managed with open and closed pump overs um, with and without delistage. Average ferment time is five to 10 days and we generally inoculate uh, with yeast at the crusher. Um, so, you know, I question how do I, how do I best deliver? And um, we've obviously, you know, in a winery, you've obviously got lots of compressed air. Um, our, our presses don't have um, their own compressors, so we require external units with holding tanks. Um, so I looked at that option. Um, if at any point in time we weren't pressing, the compressors are normally turned off. So if we then needed air for our red ferments, to air out our red ferments for that matter, um, we then required to turn on one of those compressors. Now that's a 37 kilowatt compressor. Um, we'd only need one, we do have a number of them. Um, so uh, my calculation is that then costs $15 per hour to be turned on just to apply air, compressed air to a ferment. So I thought, well, maybe I can go about it a cheaper way. A cheaper way. Um, with regard to using those compressors, if we happen to be pressing um, at, uh, at that time of aerating a red ferment, um, the, the air might be at all different pressures. So the amount of air delivered um, per minute can vary. Um, so that may then have required a, another industrial regulator, for example, which you know, for our sizes could be quite expensive. And then also extra filters or more frequent filter exchanges, um, you know, yearly or, or every two years to avoid any potential oil contamination. So replacement filters for our site um, 
do cost up to $1,000 or more. Um, and then the question is um, that I ask myself, well, then how do I actually know how much oxygen, if I use compressed air, actually goes into our ferment? Um, so I've never seen an industrial flow meter for compressed air. So I just didn't know whether that was the best option for us. And this last point on this slide um, is one that I, I came to that I couldn't that made me realize we couldn't justify heading down this option and i just asked myself this question is this you know is this a really um you know is this really desired or food grade or organic with the potential for mineral oil risks um i know my organic auditors would probably question the use of compressed air uh, and the potential for oil contamination so from that um, i decided to investigate uh, the use of food grade oxygen um, so I looked at, um, you know, around our winery and um, I was inspired by other wineries where I'd worked um, and I looked at our existing inert you know, gas setups. Um, for example, we use nitrogen um, cylinders to mix our tanks using a sparge and so forth. So I then thought, well, you know, maybe I can apply that same technique to our red ferments using oxygen instead. So I guess I, you know, just considered what we needed. So we needed an oxygen cylinder. That's easy to get. Um, an oxygen regulator and a flow meter, hose and weighted sinters. Now, much of this we already have, um, so I just need to really focus on um, getting the uh, the things that we didn't have. Uh, and I suspect most wineries have these laying around as well. Um, we have our um, inert gases on portable uh, welding gas bottle trolleys um, to make them, you know, um, easy to move around the winery. So we've got those. So we just utilise one of those when we move our oxygen around. Um, measuring the exact amount of uh, amount of oxygen uh, that we require, uh, really simple and accurate. Um, firstly, we refer to that oxygen cheat sheet that I, I showed earlier uh, to work out how many, um, you know, how many litres of oxygen re we require. And then we basically use a, a you know, the flow meter um, on that setup. Um, and our average use is two and a half to 10 litres per minute. Uh, assuming that you pump over your red wine, um, you know, it's full volume um, every pump over. Um, so how much is it to, um, to, to set this up? It's really cheap uh, and easy. And as I said, many wineries actually have this equipment already um, on hand. So um, our, our known cost for oxygen bottle rental is $14 Per month per bottle. Um, we use two every year for our 400, 500 tonnes of reds, um, which isn't a huge expense. Um, we do, however, have three in case we have one left on overnight. Um, and then the cost of the oxygen itself is $75 per bottle. So for, you know, for um, 200 bucks, you can have uh, enough oxygen for, for that amount of red grape. Um, our regulator, um, these are, this is quite a, a good brand um, regulator. Um, this is $165. It's rated, or it's, uh, yeah, it's rated to 350 kPa. Now that's a very important um, point. Um, and I'll get to that at that next, in the next slide. Um, our flow meter, again, a, a quality flow meter. It's important to make sure that you do get the right quality um, of flow meter because the cheap ones can vary in their um, their accuracy. Um, so this flow meter was $105. Um, and most importantly, it's actually calibrated to the 350 kPa that the regulator is set at. If you have a regulator that does um, have the option of changing the pressure, uh, it's important that you set the pressure and maintain it at the pressure that the flow meter is regulated, uh, is calibrated to, sorry. Um, and also through discussing all this option with, um, with gas people, um, you know, gas workshops and, and suppliers, um, they made me aware that you need to make sure that your uh, flow meter range or your desired rate um, is in the mid range of any flow meter that you have. So if you're looking at three to four liters per minute, um, you're best using a zero to 15 liter per minute flow meter as opposed to a zero to 40. So that way you're maximizing your, um, the accuracy of your equipment. Um, so we just, from our flow meter, we, we use a simple six mil braided hose. Um, 20 meters of this is, is 50 bucks. 
Um, uh, so coincidentally, our, our red wine cellar is about 30 meters long. So when we have two bottles, we just place them um, uh, somewhere in the middle and we can reach every tank. So there's, there's minimal extra work caused by, by using this system. Um, and here's our weighted center. So I, I bought this from WE Ware um, uh, a few years ago. Um, the center, so this whole unit is about 180 bucks and the replacement centers themselves, the center stones are about $40 each. I've just aimed for a mid-range porosity. Um, they can be renewed. I just use, you know, I just soak um, the center itself in a, um, in an orthophosphoric, uh, you know, beaker um, for a week um, and then exchange it with the next, you know, the one that's then being used um, that then needs, uh, you know, cleaning and, and refreshing. So that's, they're simple and they last a long time. Um, and then how do we execute this? Well, really simple. We just, um, you know, here's our, an example of our red uh, open pump over setup. Um, we simply place our center at the desired, um, you know, set at the desired rate in our tub during our pump over. Uh, and what we do do is we, review every harvest requirements with uh, a simple uh, trial using a Delastage. Now, I guess with a pump over, um, you know, if, if for example, we were to apply oxygen um, straight to our open tub and then pump straight back into the tank, then you don't really get a good idea of, of the immediate effect that the oxygen you're applying has on the wine. But if you were to do that during the rack leg of a rack and return, then you've got an immediate before and after view of, um, uh, of, of the effect of the oxygen. So we do that at the start of every harvest, just to make sure that we're sort of in the right range um, to give us a bit of a starting point. And then we, uh, we you know, um, use our intuition to then um, adjust our rates from there. Um, if a hand's more, a hands-off approach is more desired. Um, we can avoid the open tub and just do a closed pump over and then just place our inline sparge um, uh, post pump um, and then just plug our um, oxygen straight onto there. Uh, so that's quite good for when we're quite busy and we have a number of tanks uh, pumping over or if we, you know, if a staff member isn't available and we can't, you know, monitor two or three pump overs at the one time. Uh, the cost of this sparge, um, two inch sparge is $330. So, you know, um, you can see that this is a, uh, you know, a, a highly accurate, highly effective, and also a cost, you know, a affordable way of going about aerating red ferments. Um, obviously this way is not, uh, you know, perfect for every winery. Um, uh, you know, I don't know how, you know, you'd still then need to manage your rotos um, this way if you were to um, uh, aerate them in this manner. Um, but it, it is another option. And as I said, it's, uh, it's very accurate, very effective um, and affordable as well. And I guess, you know, what are the real life results to um, us having started using uh, this method of aerating our reds. Well, um, we see, uh, you know, great aromatic lift compared to, to uh, what we have uh, had to deal with in the past. Um, we see a, a very reduced use of, of copper um, in our conventional wines. Um, we see a positive mouthfeel, um, you know, an improved mouthfeel in, in the wines that we make at the moment. Um, less greenness, less harshness, and that's reflected on uh, in the lower rates of the findings that we, we use in our red wines. Um, we were having to find them back and, and, you know, get them to a point where they were, um, a, you know, attractive and approachable wines, whereas now we're, uh, we're using lower rates. Um, and more importantly, um, you know, we've had uh, far improved wine show results. Uh, we went from some of our Shirazes, you know, winning gold, uh, you know, winning, um, you know, bronzes and the occasional silver or gold to now um, being really strong performers on the wine show circuit. Um, and, you know, we value that circuit as an indication of where we're, where our wine making is at. Um, and it's not the only performance indicator that we use, but it is one of them. So, yeah, we've seen a, a definite improvement in, in, 
how our wines have been perceived um, out there in wine shows. So we uh, we really value um, aerating our red ferments. Um, we think that the way that we do it is a really smart way of going about it, um, and it's you know easy to execute and just very pleased that um, uh, that I can share this information with you all as well. Okay, so there was some there's some excellent information there from Antonio. Um, lots of practical um, information that uh, hopefully you can take on board and and implement in your, in your situation if it, if it's appropriate. So what we'll do now is we'll just open up the um, question and answer session, and there are a few questions that have come through. So I might just get the presenters to join us again on the screen. Um, I've also Ask Dr. Simon Schmidt, the bioscience research manager here at Dadabarai, who's um, involved in aeration research here at Dadabarai, he's going to join us this morning as well. Um, if there's any questions, or he might join in, in some of the QA. So, okay, so I might just jump into the QA. So, it looks, Luke, there's a couple of questions for you first up um, in terms of white ferments. So, the question is uh, you're talking about red ferments here. Have you tried aeration on whites? Yeah, we have. So um, particularly with some of the work we've done on uh, redox potential, um, with whites, you can definitely see an effect there. Um, and with those, um, rather than injecting air directly into the ferment vessel, there's often you know, a risk of nucleation and foaming over with a, with a white ferment. We're, we're very cautious to um, take it for a walk. So pump it around the winery, a longer wine, get, uh, get some, um, get, a bit of the volume out of the tank and then we'll um we'll add some oxygen into that typically using a, a sparger whether that's the um you know, the, the pipe style or whether it's just an injected sparger because we don't have the, the solid concern that you typically have in a red um take that for a for a wander and bring it back um and obviously there's as jeremy mentioned i think as well there's you know we use um oxygen in whites particularly for um for um hyper oxidation as well so you know that's um that's really effective and then i think that gives you a bit of a benefit of you know of saturating the the wine prior to prior to fermentation and giving giving the yeast a, a good starting point but um yeah and you certainly see the uh the curve of the the redox potential on those whites um dropping very quickly when you when you're adding any any air into them that's for sure I might just stay with you, Luke, for just, there's another question here about um, how you choose which uh, wines and um, from last vintage, which wines you choose to apply aeration to, uh, what's the criteria you use and when you select batches, for example, variety or wine style? Yep, so look, uh, typically that's somewhat a, a winemaking call. Um, so areas that we'll, we'll look at will be things like, you know, if there's a a Merlot or a, or a Cabernet that's looking a, a bit green might get a little bit of um might get a little bit of that. Um, typically, you know, we'd be going for more of a, a full body type white if we're looking at that as well. So something like a, a Chardonnay or a Viognier. Um, uh, and particularly, you know, if you're looking at um, organic wines, they they really benefit you know without the um, addition of or limited addition you know DAP or copper restrictions on those wines. Um, yeah, the, obviously the, the benefits of, um, of air addition either through these systems, and we see it with the pulse air systems as well for cap management that typically they don't need the same levels of, uh, of DAP um, addition, um, you know, not on, on um, organics, but, you know, on, on all wines typically if they're, if they're going through that. So we'll tend to favour, you know, those wines that might need that extra help on, on vessels with, with either air addition or with uh, pulse air. Okay, and I, I think there's one there's one more that's come in come in when you were when during your presentation is about how early do you believe is a good moment to start aeration in red ferments? Uh, well, I guess once once you know the ferment going, I think is probably the the key the key stage. So typically through you know through crushing and and ferment handling, you'll probably get a fair bit of oxygen into the wine to start. Um, but typically, as soon as you start to see that fermentation kicking off, and you know the redox 
potential is a really good indicator of that before you'll see the, the BOME drop necessarily as well. Um, that's, that's typically when you want to start adding it and then you want to slow that down towards the back end of the ferment, which I think um, you know, Jeremy mentioned as well, um, so that you don't you know, add too much at, at the back end. Okay, um, Roger, I might jump to you. There's a couple on Redox here. This one is, what is the effect on the Redox with a continuous sparge of O2? Um, so bluntly, almost nothing. So this, this gets to the heart of the confusion between dissolved oxygen and redox. The dissolved oxygen is essentially inert. Okay, I'll repeat what I just said. Dissolved oxygen is essentially inert. It needs to be activated to peroxide before there's any oxidation reactions. That's the kinetics. Now I understand coming from a background in microox or traditional practice within the industry, I have to tell you from the outside, from a science perspective, there's confusion about oxygen and delivery. And I know you, you, you monitor that, you quantify that. The real effect is how much peroxide did you make? Because that's what changed the redox. And that takes, that's related to the iron content and to the iron complex of tartrate. So most of the iron that's available in a juice is iron two. Half of that is tied up as an iron two tartrate complex. It's the iron two tartrate complex that activates the oxygen. So you can only make as much peroxide and have a redox effect as the amount of iron two tartrate in that wine at that time. And putting more and more oxygen in becomes irrelevant after you've used up your iron two, which is 20, 25 micromolar. And the answer is the amount of peroxide you'd get from that is quite small. And the amount of oxygen you use is less than a milligram. So the first addition up to a milligram is the important one. The, my understanding and my experience is anything beyond that is irrelevant until the iron two is returned again and is capable of being use of oxygen. So that's where it isn't just oxygen delivery. It's going to be what's in that juice and its ability to return to iron two to take up the next bit, but it only takes a little bit. That's why a very small amount, it, now it's what you don't need a sparge yet. You're not trying to get half saturation. You're not trying to live up large volumes. You're trying to get half to one milligram per liter dissolved. And that's going to be a, a bit of a difficult concept for people who are used to talking lots. Please understand what I'm saying. It's from very good experience and that's all you need. So um, you can do that and if it makes you feel good and you'll be able to talk about those numbers, the reality is it actually did nothing once you've used up your iron too. And like I showed on that curve, until about four hours come back and that starts to come back down again, adding oxygen is not gonna have an effect because there's no iron too to, re to react with to get activated. Does that make sense? And you can, con you can convince yourself of that by doing some trials on a, on a fermentation bench where you're actually just adding microliters of peroxide solution versus adding oxygen. And you'll get the same effect. It's just that more and more oxygen doesn't do any more. So that's important to understand, both in the whites and the reds, is, um, so uh, Luke referred to the bubbling and the, th that's true if you're trying to get large amounts of oxygen in. I would suggest that's a mistake if you could just get the first little piece in. Is that clear? The second one, if I could just comment on the other factor about the early one, I presume most people understand that with that SO2 and in reds when it's bound up with pigment, the first day or two of fermentation, the oxygen is reacting with phenyl oxidase. So that's enzymatic. Enzymatic produces water, it doesn't produce peroxide. So that's an oxygen gobbler, which is gonna go away as the fermentation begins. And don't confuse the oxygen consumption due to enzyme reaction with the peroxide production, which is the chemical reaction, which is the one that affects the redox. Is that clear? So the real redox effect of any oxygen added will be usually a day or so in, not just because it's convenient to do a pump over, because that's when your PPO activity is beginning to decline. So, um, Hopefully that's a long answer, but um, right. you know, 
we'll have to come back to it because simply saying it once, I don't think most people will fully understand what I refer to. But um, small amounts are all that's needed, and beyond that, it's independent. What, what, okay, while, while we're talking about chemical reactions, I might just jump down to a question. There's another question about um, from someone, I've previously been told that excessive aeration once ethanol concentration is over 10% will preferentially result in oxidation of ethanol. Would this still be a concern given the advice that we've seen today that you cannot add too much air? Um, so it's not a concern because oxygen doesn't oxidize ethanol to aldehyde. It doesn't, okay? There's a lot of confusion. Well, we could perhaps have another workshop just on oxidation in wine, but the predominant understanding in the world of wine seems to be quite mistaken, that we actually don't have free radicals. We actually don't ethanol to aldehyde formation. Otherwise, any oxide, these treatments would be aldehyde bombs, and they're not. That reaction doesn't occur, even though we write it on a piece of paper. The kinetic mechanism for that reaction does not occur. And so we've got to get a better understanding of the mechanism of oxidation kinetics to understand when are we on thin ice and when are we in a danger zone and when are we perfectly safe. Because that reaction doesn't occur is why you can add lots and lots. My point is you don't need lots and lots to get the effect we're talking about. Okay. There's been a few more come through as we're discussing this. There's there's one here, um, it's just talking about smaller ferment size. So is aeration necessary in small open top, I'm assuming open vat ferment, say around three to four tonnes? Um, are there examples of aeration in small three to four ferments? Who wants to take that one? Roger, do you want to comment on that one? So one of the graphs I showed, one of the slides I showed you was, um, probably would be uh, about a one ton Pinot fermentation open top. And you remember those graphs, uh, those redox on a punch down was up to about zero, which is too low, and it dropped down to about minus 100. So even exposure to the air is not gonna be good enough to get it into solution to give you the effect on redox. All it'll do will be oxygen absorption on the top layer. Now you do a punch down, some of that will get pushed down but that declines very quickly back to again, minus 100 millivolts. That's not where you want to be. And so um, there is air there, you do get some, but it actually has no consequence. And, and we've got to get our physics together to understand it isn't just that it's exposed to air. That's not good enough. Not good enough to get this reaction in liquid phase. It's actually affecting yeast metabolism. It's actually affecting whether we get sulfides or we don't. So it is open top, closed top, I'd argue almost no difference in what we're just talking about. Rotaries is back to why aren't rotaries in the stationary position and aerated? I've never understood that. Again, I've been away for a long time, but that is the reason why um, you would want to be able to do that in a rotary and you'd want to be able to do it periodically and maybe the periodic addition at the expense of the mixing is actually more desirable because I'm not sure that more and more mixing gives you more and more extraction like in, like many people believe. So we've got this collision of practices where we think more of it is better with the reality of where there's a limitation on what can be achieved. And what I'm trying to have you understand is it doesn't need a lot of that to get the effect. So an open top is might make you think that it is more aerated than a closed top fermenter. Um, but when it comes to redox, that's not the case. Okay, um, Luke, someone's picked up on something you mentioned in your presentation. You mentioned being able to minimise SO2 use in the vineyard by using air in the winery. Why is this? Well, that was more of a that was more of a change in practice. We're doing it at the same time, so we've been um, because you're adding air into the um, the wines. What we what we've found is that. Uh, when you're adding SO2 in the vineyard, particularly on red, to, to protect the grapes prior to the getting to the winery, the um, the benefits we were seeing were being outweighed by um, by H2S formation or you know having a lot more sulphur in there. We found that by eliminating um, uh, SO2 additions to those wines, unless they're going a, a very long way, um, we had improved um, outcomes with uh, ferment health as well. So um, our general um, 
practice now is to is to not add SO2 unless it's traveling a very long way and there's a high risk of um, uh, oxidation or fermentation kicking off prior to when we're ready for it. So can I just chime in, Matt, quickly? Sure. So I just talked about oxygen being activated to produce peroxide and it needs a complex. One of the things that's going to scavenge the peroxide is SO2. So if you have SO2 in juice and you add air, you're not going to get the whole effect if something's taking away the peroxide. And so back to your point, Matt, that's exactly right. That's exactly what we would expect. That, that retained SO2 induced by the first day or two is actually quenching the effect that you're trying to achieve on producing peroxide. And um, you would get a better effect in fermentation by not of having the SO2 initially. Be worth thinking about again from enzymatic versus pure cultures and, and um, population control with SO2. Um, it's going to have an effect in the early stage of how effective your oxygen add is because it's going to quench and steal part of the peroxide you just made, which is the real active ingredient in the redox. Roger, there's a question here about for you on. Um... You go, sorry, can you give a typical daily milligrams per litre requirement for the small daily O2 additions to the reds that you mentioned? Nope, I won't. And I won't for a very good reason, is that the wines and juices are so different in their reaction capacity that it's an irrelevant number. Okay? So um, if you looked at the distribution of iron content in, in 100 juices, um, that'll show you the capacity to produce peroxide if it got air. And that's a big brand. So trying to say that there is an average number and you want to use this, I think is a mistake. It says you're not understanding the individuality. We would do an addition and look for the redox response and probably keep adding until we saw that redox response. It's going on a case by case basis. And um, that's a little different than the perhaps the practices thinking where you just need an average amount. I'd argue you need individual amounts and you'll need redox to tell you how much to add. There was also a, there was also a much follow up on that. There's also a graph, I think you in, in your presentation that showed um, redox potential and temperature. There's a comment in here. Uh, do you have a comment about the aeration and temperature of fermentation? Um, well, why, well, you want to control temperature for other reasons, which is primarily yeast fermentation and yeast health. If we get too hot, we'll actually kill them off quickly. So that's, that's a temperature control problem of fermentation. People can talk about extraction rates and that'll be more, much to do with concentration and time and other temperature effects. But this is temperature on redox is how fast they're fermenting. So if you looked at that curve, and I think I've got it there if you, can you give me a sharing screen? I'll pop it up again if you want. Uh, yep. Um, where do I see it? Um, can you see that? Yes, we can. Yes. Yep. Up, up on the cabinet block here. Notice how quickly this plunges due to temperature. So we, I'm, I pointed out this is minus 100 versus minus 250, and the difference is 8 degrees C. But notice how quickly it begins and how quickly it plunges. This is really the temperature effect on the lag or the activity to onset fermentation. And it has the effect on redox within 24 hours. So that's very much the temperature effect on yeast activity, on glutathione production, on reduction of potential. So the other feature, as I indicated before, was the reason we don't like using milligram or quantity levels is there's going to be glutathione in the grape juice to begin with. It's going to vary. There's going to be iron in the content of juices that's going to vary. And there's going to be different yeast strains that produce different amounts of glutathione for export. So you're going to have three variables that are going to determine what's a good amount of, of oxygen to deliver to get a redox effect. And all three of them together are variables in composition. And we would celebrate that, except that that's going to affect how quickly these curves decline. So there is a temperature effect. There is also going to be a glutathione effect. And there is also going to be a, an ability to convert delivered oxygen into peroxide to get the spike piece. And that's why I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to just understand that spike curve. 
because that's really critical in terms of what's going on in a particular juice. I think one of your original questions was about probe measurement. Someone's asked, um, uh, what exactly is the probe measuring in terms of chemistry? Um, in the one minute answer. So sure. Um, whenever you have a solid in touch with a liquid, ionic species, electrons and ions in the solid will align themselves near the surface. And the liquid solution with all of its conducting complexes and ions of different kinds will align itself with the surface. And at that interface, there will be, um, there will be an interaction of density of charge in electrons at the surface versus charged species in solution. And that difference in potential is what is the redox potential or the electrode potential. Now, if I use something other than platinum, different material, it's different. So people were puzzled by the fact that you could have a redox probe that's made out of carbon or glassy fibers, and you've got a different redox potential than you did with platinum. The answer is, well, you'd expect that. It has to do with the solid as well as the liquid. So a lot of people in solution chemistry uh, don't get the solid property of the electrode, but in fact, it's the interface. So if we keep on using platinum electrodes all the time, we'll be quite okay. It's just that when we're going to swap different kinds of, of materials, all of which will give a potential, we're going to end up with different scales because the solid affects the interfacial potential. So that's what it really is. And it turns out that the complexes of iron and copper, but mostly iron, particularly iron three versus iron two complexes, they determine what are the charge entities that want to sit at the surface of that platinum. And that's why the potential of wine is around 300. Whereas it was in water, it'd be 600. Um, and again, this is a property of the solution, which is a mixture property, but it's only a property of the reactive electron species. And iron is involved in those reactions, which is why the redox potential is iron dominated in grape juice. That's not the case in beer, because they don't have the tartrate. Okay. okay, so yeah. a lot of things different in different juices. That's what makes it so special about the wine case. There's a question here. Um, there's a question here. I'm not sure whether Simon, you might want to jump in here um, or Roger. Um, are there any concerns with oxygenation during fermentation impacting on co-inoculated malo? Simon, want to take it? Did you yeah, ask okay. that We've done some of those experiments and uh, directly compared aerated and non-aerated ferments that have been both co-inoculated and sequentially inoculated at pilot scale no, um, in reds and we've seen no um, specific effects and in particular we were really looking to see whether the, whether or not there were going to be detrimental outcomes from mixing air and mlf in the same sort of situation and now we haven't seen any detrimental effects on either malolactic or uh, malic acid consumption or the sensory qualities of those wines. So I guess that's about as straightforward as I can say it. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, is there... I'll come in, Matt, quickly. Sure. Is, I was just talking to Jeremy earlier, but in the old principles books from Bordeaux, uh, Ribéry, Gagnon and Paino, when they first did their tracheology series, not the 60s and 70s ones, and not the new ones, but the old ones, there's a table of anaerobic malolactic growth and utilization of malic. Aeration at the beginning, I think this is what Simon's referring to, versus continuous aeration, which is what we'd in this workshop talk about as redox control. The fastest and complete conversion of malic was continuous aeration. And the millivolts of those conditions were 300 to 400, compared with 300 dropping down to about 100, and so I've been down about 100 to begin with. So I'd suggest that redox, redox potential is actually having a dramatic effect on my yeah, life. The problem is, do we actually, it's can we improve right. that? Yeah, in front of the the SO2 using the um, okay, there's, there's, quite, there's quite a few questions here. I'm just trying to um, categorize similar ones in the same thing. Um, 
there's one down here I thought was quite interesting. Um, uh, sorry, it was on it was on histamine. Field additions of SO2 also inhibit histamine formation, which is desirable. Does oxygen addition pre or early ferment negate this activity? Has that been has that been looked at? Simon, no, 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 we're not, we haven't looked at that here. We haven't looked at, I can't, um, I'm just looking for the question, but off the top of my head, I can't think of anyone that's directly looked at that, no. Okay, all right, we might just have to take, those, take that on a notice. Um, if you can't automate oxygen additions, would it be better to do an initial large dose to achieve high O2 saturation, followed by a constant small dose to maintain a higher millivolt level? or small discrete additions more often. Luke, you might've had uh, some experience here. Uh, you might, yeah. There we go. Um, look, I think <clears throat> Roger certainly got some views on this, which I'd be keen to, to hear as well. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, when usually when you're starting, you've got quite a high, um, level of oxygen in there at the start as it is. And really the key is, you know, as Sir Roger's showing with that redox curve is trying to, to bump it up. I think if you, if it was a, a labor factor, so, you know, every time you had to add oxygen required some form of interaction with the person compared to possibly being able to leave something on for an extended period of time, um, I would probably uh, on that side, um, if you're just looking at a very small amount over time um, to try and maintain it. But then that depends on how much you're adding and how much waste is there compared to, I suppose, the, the cost of someone coming along and doing a, a smallish addition uh, regularly as well. So, Roger, I don't know if you got thoughts on, on that. Well, so, um, yeah, you'd be better to do small additions continuously or um, periodically, but they don't need to be a large addition. That's the point. That's the whole point. It only needs to be a little bit if you keep on topping it up. And so a timed repeated addition that is uncoupled from pump overs is perfectly fine. So it's, I understand the conviction of mixing and doing a pump over and that's a good time to add oxygen, but it actually shouldn't have to be like I think Jeremy referred to as times where you don't want more extraction. What you do want to do is roll it below the skin cap and you'd like to control the redox below the skin cap and you can do that if you inject it to the base not in a pump over mode and you can do it periodically with a timer so if you didn't have a redox probe for this harvest and you did nothing more than install a timer that actually turn a little pump to bubble air down to the bottom of the tank depending on your size that would be better than nothing and that would give you some kind of uniformity ripple you wouldn't know what potential it is but it's probably much more reliable than letting it go naturally and trying to do something periodically that doesn't have a lasting effect. And just, I just, that's, that's some good practical advice there, Roger. Just to follow on from that, at what point then would you say to turn that off? Um, two thirds the way through? Or? That'd be a judgment. Yeah. So it's, it has most to do with the growth condition and they're growing to set themselves up for viability. So once you've hit the, I say, midpoint two thirds way through, they're actually strong enough in viability not to need it anymore. They're turning over with good maintenance and they've got a good viable population. It doesn't need it at that point because now they're not producing glutathione, which is what's driving the pull down. So now the redox potentials climb their way back up again because we're not, we're getting rid of the glutathione every time we do that. Now they're not producing it. Now there's less need. So as a rule of thumb, I, Jeremy had one of, trying to say when would you do pick a number, but it could be three quarters of the way through fermentation would be perfectly fine if you were worried about it. Yeah. Back to the other comments about uh, well, the questions quickly is, again, as an outsider, who's actually an insider, please understand my comment with goodness. The terminology is so tied up in microox and centers and dissolving and bubble size, you'll have to uncouple that thinking because what I'm talking about is, I suppose, nano oxidation. Even microox, as it's practiced, is a joke compared to what we're talking about. So 
um, people will need to think twice about how they get oxygen in there because it isn't about the oxygen. What we're trying to do is deliver a little bit and have it well mixed. And that principle doesn't require lots and lots of spine bubbles or lots of loss of dissolving. What it needs is a well mixed environment that you can inject and control. So people will play things. Hopefully this will be the most exciting and productive harvest in Australia for the last 50 years. I'll throw it out there because <laughs> I, I think you have a chance and you have a lot of people interested in trying to better understand what is um, a long term, I'd say, challenge in winemaking under Australian conditions. And the fact you're having a workshop and the fact that these questions are coming up, I think is an indicator of that. Yeah, look, I, I, I think I think you're right, Roger. I think there's there's a lot of interest in this, and I think probably people are actually doing certain um, techniques to try and get air in there. It's just now taking it to that next level and you know pushing it a little bit further. Um, there is a question here, and I guess I think it's already been answered through this question about: Do you think you're able to get oxygen saturation level traditional aerative pump overs? Um, I think we've pretty well answered that. That's you know it's not you know you'll get air in, but you won't get anywhere near as much so that you need. Um, without that sort of constant dribbling of little little bits in. There is a few more questions here. I might um, I might ask a couple more questions and then I think we'll um, we'll, we'll sign off. Um, one down the bottom. Are there ways to manipulate redox other than with oxygen? Uh, um, yes, commercial scale, no, because of, so you can manipulate redox in bench trials and hopefully in culture even um, by just adding peroxide. And in fact, it would be good for some people to practice that to understand what peroxide actually does. And you would begin to see, and I'm not talking large amounts, I'm talking microliter additions. So peroxide will do it, but it's not approved. So it's certainly not in the United States for wine and table wine. Given oxygen, given what we understand about the mechanism, given the fact that it produces peroxide, it's going to be difficult to talk about any kind of regulatory agency that wants to say you shouldn't be allowed to add peroxide. Now, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural outcome of what we're doing. So to say we couldn't add it. The reason you would want to do it is if you had a juice that was very high in glutathione or very high in iron content, that's going to be difficult to shift the redox because it's strongly buffered. That's why you'd want to go straight to peroxide, because if you can't produce the peroxide from your iron, oxygen, you'd actually want to be able to do peroxide. That's all it is, is a peroxide reaction. We just have to deliver the oxygen to get it there. And that works in wine. It doesn't work as well, as I said, in beer and other fermentations, because they don't have the iron tartrate complex. That's essential in the mechanism of um, this conversion. So, um, Probably enough, so I feel like I'm saying too much, and um, my brothers. Yeah. That's okay. There's a, there's a comment down here, and I might direct this one to Jeremy. Um, something about uh, there's potentially a critical um, oxygen use is uh, potentially this obviously is critical due to the shortage of DAP. I think you mentioned in your presentation about not wanting to overuse DAP. Can I pose the question, how much, have you, have you saved a lot in, not, not dollar terms, I guess, just, but do you use less DAP now that you're using oxygen in the last few years? Yeah, definitely. So we're probably using at least probably a quarter of the amount that we were using in the past. <clears throat> if you're looking at um, trying to manage the end levels and reduction in during fermentation. So yeah, it's been a savvy thing for, for, you know, dollars and cents, but also for the, for the seller to have to go and make the additions as well with labour. Yep. Um, maybe we'll find one more question. Um, uh, sorry, just bear with me two seconds. I think we've answered that question. Okay, this one's probably maybe steering outside of fermentation and heading towards uh, maturation. Um, I'll just read the question. If I understand Roger correctly, he is saying that micro-oxygenation is the way to go for all ferments, large or small. Excess oxygen has no effect. Staying with small ferments again, does fermentation in barrels achieve the effect in a more cost-effective way? Um, I'm not sure of the nature of the question. You can ferment in barrel and you can control redox mm. just as well as a tank. It's just that 
that the scale is the easier thing. So it's easier to do, um, but you could have one for every barrel. Unless you're going to use one barrel as an indicator of a batch of 100, that's a bit of a guess. Um, you could do that, it's just that you'd need lots of probes or lots of labour. The whole purpose of this is to have a sensor on the side of a tank that with an automated pump over, you actually don't have to worry about anything. So it's got to be automated and it's got to be more precise in our delivery. You could do it by handheld and by going from barrel to barrel, but um, it's not a limitation, it's just a practical implementation, I suppose. Okay, I'm going to... Um finish off with just to give you a little bit more information um we've put together an extension package to support you on your quest to aerate technique um it can be found on the adabri website and it's going to go live prior to sorry two seconds it's going to go live prior to the vintage 22 it's going to consist of a range of extension materials from digital content to printable fact sheets and how-to guides and it will complement this workshop nicely um, I'll email everyone who's attended today uh, a link prior to Vintage, and I'm looking at probably the link will probably come out um, and go live sort of uh, mid to late February um, prior to Reds being harvested and fermented out. But of course, if you get stuck, don't be shy and contact the Nadabri help desk. Uh, and if need be, I can also probably put you in touch with um, one of the speakers or any of the speakers today, um, should you have a question regarding this topic. I've only one more thing to do, and that's to thank our presenters today for openly sharing their experiences about how they go about using aeration and some of the science and, and the theory behind it. Um, so um, I'm sure there's many virtual claps going on as, as we sit here. And I'll be sending out a short survey with about four questions. It should only take one to two minutes to complete. Look, this is really important for us to understand how and what we do and whether we can tweak what we do to, to make it more enjoyable or, or provide more information to you as, um, as you quest to use your aeration. So look, thanks again for attending today. So I've run out of words and just like to thank everyone for attending and we'll see you at the next Adabri event, which is a Adabri webinar this Thursday, the 2nd of December. And the webinar is titled Reviewing the Standard Procedures for Grape Sugar and Colour Measurement. So thanks again, have a great day and we'll, we'll see you next time.